it again. Uh, we will take up uh, agenda item two, uh, receive an update on the COVID-19 response. Um, and uh, then we'll go into board discussion at this point. I'll turn it over to staff for a presentation. Before the staff begins a presentation, any members of the public that have requested to speak on item two, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions provided to you. You will be muted until it is your turn to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. Today's COVID-19 update will include our public health officer, Dr. Wilma Wooten, who will provide a public health update as well as additional information on the county's status on the tiers system. We'll then be joined by Nick Maschione, our agency director and head of the county's COVID test, trace, and treat, or T3 efforts, for an update on vaccinations underway throughout the county. Additionally, Vince Nicoletti will provide an update on compliance efforts, and Andy Pease, our incident command finance chief, will provide an update on funding sources. Finally, David Estrella, our director of housing and community development services, will provide an update on the rental assistance program. So without further ado, I'll welcome Dr. Wooten. Thank you, Don. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. The epi curve on this slide shows COVID-19 cases by onset of illness and provides a historical re review of cases to date. Today, I will bring your attention to the last three months of activity. On November 10th, San Diego County transitioned to the purple tier due to our high case rates and uh, testing positivity percentages. With cases continuing to rise, on December 6th, the state implemented a regional stay-at-home order for Cal Southern California, which includes San Diego and 10 other counties. Ultimately, the entire state was on the stay-at-home order. The criteria for this order was intensive care unit uh, or ICU admissions below 15% for any um, jurisdiction. For the next seven weeks, ICU capacity for the southern region was 0%, and many businesses uh, and uh, business sectors were closed for indoor and outdoor operations until January 25th, when the state's four-week projection for ICU capacity was over 15%, and the state regions opened again, with San Diego being in the purple tier. As is seen on the right of the slide, the November, December, January surge um, has started to decline. In the next slide, from January 1st through February 7th, daily case counts have slowly declined after the first seven days of the new year. A significant rise in cases above 4,000 uh, from the end of December into early January was followed by a slow decline since January 8th. Case counts have continued to slowly decrease from approximately 2,000 daily cases and below from January 23rd uh, through January 29th to mostly uh, below 1,500 in the past nine days from January 30th uh, through February 7th. Since the last presentation in the next slide, to your board on January 26th, an additional 18,630 laboratory confirmed cases have been reported for a total of 247,262 positive COVID-19 cases. These numbers are as of 1159, Sunday, February 7th. This table provides a summary of cumulative cases with a breakdown by age, gender, hospitalization, ICU admissions, and deaths. The age range is from zero to now 108 years of age with a median age of about 36 years. The 20 to 49 year old age groups comprise 54% of all cases or 133,659 of the total number of cases. Gender remains relatively unchanged. Hospitalizations make up 4.4% or 10,765 of all cases. Thankfully, hospitalizations are declining as you will see shortly. 1,511 of those hospitalized have been admitted to the ICU. Also, this category is decreasing. This number is approximately 0.6% of the total number of cases and 14% of the total number of those hospitalized. The total number of cases also include 2,821 uh, deaths or 1.1% of all cases. These 
Uh, COVID-19 data and more can be found on the county's website at www.coronavirus-sd.com. Now on the next slide, this figure shows the status of uh, San Diego County's non-federal adult and pediatric hospital beds. In the past 14 days, hospital census data from January 25th uh, through February 7th show a decreasing trend of 27%. In the same 14-day uh, period, ICU census data show a decreasing trend uh, at 21%. Looking at the past seven days from February 1 uh, through the 7th, hospital census data show a decreasing trend of 17%. For the same seven-day period, ICU census data show a decreasing trend of 14%. Now, this uh, next graphic shows ICU capacity in a different way. The numbers in the blue bars show the number of patients uh, in uh, an ICU bed for COVID-related reasons, which is uh, seen to be decreasing. The numbers in the orange bars are for patients in ICU beds for non-COVID-related uh, reasons. The number in the green open box show the number of beds that are staffed and immediately available to take ICU uh, patients. As of February 7th, the hospital system had 625 beds or 80% occupied and 38 beds or 5% that were staffed and immediately available for a patient to be admitted. The remaining 15% the remaining are beds that are available for surge capacity when needed but they are not staffed. Now that the regional stay-at-home order has been lifted, the state is back in the blueprint for a safer economy framework. The state remains uh, with 54 counties in the purple tier, one in the red tier, three in the orange tier, and no county currently meets the criteria for the yellow tier. With almost the entire state in the purple tier, the San Diego County case rate and testing positivity remains elevated, but also has been decreasing over past weeks. As we wait for the state to post this week's calculated metrics, we are showing metrics based on staff's calculation of local data. The unadjusted case rate for January 24th through the 30th, after a seven day lag, is 35.4 with the adjusted case rate at 35 point, or rather 34.2, and the testing positivity is 9.1%. These results are decreasing, but still has San Diego County in the purple tier. San Diego County's testing rate is 512.3, which is above the state's median testing rate of 479.82. Staff has also calculated the health equity positivity metric to be 12.1%, also characteristic of the purple tier. Now, from another view, this slide shows the trend of um, unadjusted and adjusted case rates over time. Note that the threshold for the case rate to be in the purple tier is 7.1 or higher per 100,000 population. Given the current adjusted uh, uh, case rate is approximately 34. San Diego County has yet a long ways to go to reach the threshold uh, to be in the red tier, which is seven or less per 100,000 population. Outbreaks represent a delayed outcome after cases are identified. This slide shows the comparison of monthly outbreaks since the beginning of the pandemic with the largest number of outbreaks occurring in November and December as demonstrated by the circle. November had 243 outbreaks representing 1,957 cases and December showed 245 outbreaks representing 1,503 cases. January had 214 outbreaks representing 1,226 cases, which was a 13% decrease in outbreaks and an 18% decrease in related cases uh, compared to, to December. Currently, February has 70 outbreaks representing 278 cases. Since November 1st, 772 outbreaks representing 400, 964 cases accounted for 63% of all community setting outbreaks that have occurred since this pandemic uh, started. 
examining the various sectors uh, where these community setting outbreaks have occurred since November 1st. The top settings include or included uh, businesses with 357 outbreaks, representing 46% of the total number of outbreaks for this period. This setting was followed by restaurants and restaurants and bars. Uh, next is preschools at 60 outbreaks, governments at 53 outbreaks, healthcare at 52 outbreaks, and last, faith-based organizations at 50 outbreaks. Indeed, uh, the news about COVID-19 declining daily case counts is welcomed. On the flip side of the coin, there is also a great uh, concern about B117 or the UK variant that continues to be a potential threat. As of February 8th in San Diego County, there have been 138 confirmed cases, which is 51 more cases than reported to your board two weeks ago. Of the total cases, there have been uh, one death, this is unchanged from my last report, and two hospitalizations, uh, one additional uh, uh, hospitalization since my last report. The median age is 34 years, and the age range is zero to 76 years of age. Gender demographics is equally split at 50-50%. No cases of, South, of the South African or the Brazilian variant uh, has been identified to date and we are continuing to monitor those new variants. In closing, while cases are slowly declining, we maintain cautious optimism. Staff will continue to monitor for a potential uh, post-Super Bowl surge over the next 10 to 14 days and monitor for an increase in cases of the UK variant as well as other new variants uh, that uh, are out there and are in the United States. In the meantime, all San Diegans are urged to continue to follow all prescribed health precautions. In alignment with the CDC and the state, please wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. If you are sick, isolate yourself at home and get tested. And when it is your turn to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, get vaccinated. Thank you to the general public for your continued vigilance in helping all San Diegans be COVID safe. Now welcome Agency Director Nick Mashione. Thank you, Dr. Wooten, and to our entire public health team and our community partners. During the month of January, we were able to approximately do 330,000 vaccinations region-wide. Based on that, we estimate in order to reach our goal to vaccinate 70% of the county residents aged 16 and older by July 1st, an average of approximately 22,881 individual doses need to provide, be provided each day by the county, our partners, and all of our vaccine providers throughout the region. As I've mentioned before, health equity continues to drive our planning and implementation for T3 and COVID-19 vaccinations. For instance, the vaccine events that the county hosts and sponsors with our partners, we have prioritized placing vaccination sites in those communities hit hardest by COVID-19. As you can see from the map, the shaded regions reflect census tracts that have the least health opportunities and are in the health equity quartile. Currently, we have four active superstations and 15 active point of dispensing vaccination events, or as we call pods. This includes rotating events, primarily throughout our backcountry region. Later this week, a fifth superstation in the North Coastal region will be launched by Scripps Health and will opening another pod in the city of Vista. But there are still more in the works. This map shows the county and county sponsored sites, but there are other vaccination providers as well. For instance, Kaiser Permanente, they're reaching out to their members to set up vaccination appointments. Pharmacies are also approved providers of vaccines and CVS and Walgreens are part of the federal pharmacy partnership program that is providing on-site vaccinations to those in skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. And yet there's other providers as well, community health clinics, medical group practices, military and veterans administration, and our tribal health programs and urban Indian organizations. Now let's hone in on our county efforts. 
When looking back to the first week of February, we were operating eight county-hosted vaccine sites. Now, this is a reduction of one from our last update as we closed out our Escondido North Inland Livewell Center site to open up the higher capacity North County vaccination superstation in St. Marcos. In addition, in partnership with Palomar Health, we're adding a community pod in the city of Escondido to serve more of the North Inland community. We now have four vaccination superstations and three hospital county partnership sites. Additionally, we have Operation Collaboration, a very innovative partnership between county fire and numerous local fire agencies that have joined together to organize rotating vaccine events throughout the region with the focus on our rural communities. This past week, Operation Collaboration was vaccinating at four locations that change on a week to week basis. Our mobile vaccination efforts are also in full swing, reaching the long-term care facilities not covered by the federal pharmacy program. During the first week of February, a daily average of 12,000 vaccines were provided through our different efforts. Now, as you can see, those totals were limited by the supply of the vaccine and reduced weekly allocations by the state. Had we received a robust supply of vaccine we estimate that with our current capacity, we could have averaged 21,000 daily vaccinations. Now, in preparation for when supplies expand, we continue to build out our infrastructure and increase capacity. And by the end of February, we anticipate to have 12 county-hosted vaccine sites, five super state vaccine superstations with a possible sixth superstation, six to eight county hospital partnership sites and many more rotating operation collaboration sites, as well as the expansion of our mobile vaccination teams to increase and reach our most vulnerable homebound seniors. This would put us at a goal capacity of 35,000 average vaccines per day, vaccinations per day. That's well above our regional goal of 22,881 vaccines, vaccinations per day. With our other entities in the region stepping up and with more available vaccine, we can easily reach 70% of our population well before July 1st. Now, currently we're vaccinating all of phase 1A, which includes healthcare workers, residents of skilled and assisted living facilities, public health nurses, behavioral health outpatient and inpatient clinics, as well as many other healthcare providers. And while the state has given its okay, to all of phase 1B tier one at the discretion of the local public health officer, in San Diego County, we remain focused on healthcare workers and individuals aged 65 years and older who we know are most likely to be hospitalized and die. Next in line will be those working in law enforcement and emergency services, and education and childcare and food and agriculture. And we are prepared and ready to vaccinate these uh, important groups of essential workers as soon as we get more vaccine. As we hear and read every day, vaccine supply is a hot topic for San Diego County, the state, the nation, and indeed the world. So I want to take a moment to explain our supply in our region. As of February 6th, 651,450 vaccines have been delivered to our county, as you can see in this slide. This includes doses shipped to pharmacies for the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program, multi-county entities like Kaiser Permanente, and to the county as the local health jurisdiction. It does not include doses provided for the military and Veterans Administration, as well as the tribal health programs and urban Indian organizations. As of February 7th in our region, 503,429 doses, to be exact, have been administered, which represents 77% of what we have received. We do know that we have 7,012 doses that have been ad administered, but are currently being documented so that they'll be showing up in our registry in the coming days. The remaining 141,000 doses is broken down as follows. About 15,000 doses are with CVS and Walgreens for the federally operated program. Another 15,000 is what our county sponsored events, such as our county pods and operation collaboration that we're doing this week. And about 111,000 are with state enrolled providers, 
which includes hospitals and community clinics, medical practices, and local pharmacies who are currently not participating in a fairly operated program for SNFs or long-term care facilities. Just want to note that the total number of these providers throughout our county region is 263. So we are working actively with all of these state enrolled providers in the region to, to ensure that they're able to administer their allocation of vaccine within the week, like we do in our county pods and county sponsored events. And if not, we work with each of them to ensure those doses can get to individuals as soon as possible. Now let's look ahead. Um, there are a couple of factors we're dealing with. First, vaccine availability is key and central and continues to be our most critical rate limiting step and concern that we're monitoring very closely. Last week, to give you a sense, we received just over a quarter of the doses we requested for the state for our entire region. Many of our providers saw large reductions in the number of vaccines that were given, and many did not receive any at all. The result of low vaccine supply is what we have, it results in having less appointments available for first doses. Again, despite the low supply, we're preparing for better days and continue to build our infrastructure and expand our workforce. We have some good news to share. Over 650 emergency medical technicians, EMTs, are being trained and will be supporting the efforts of the county and local fire agencies as vaccinators. 446 Medical Reserve Corps volunteers have been cleared to work. Over half of them have been trained and already working in our vaccination locations. We've also trained 132 student nurses and their instructors from many of our local community colleges and universities, and they're supporting our county pods as part of the clinical placements for their training. And we're working with the state and National Guard to send over additional trained volunteers to support our county vaccination sites. And as of yesterday, 211 San Diego is now supporting those 65 and older without internet access to help make appointments online for their vaccinations. We're also supporting 201 San Diego by sending over nearly 100 county staff to bolster their call center. As I mentioned before, we're still adding more vaccination locations to the region so that we're able to meet the need as soon as the vaccine becomes more readily available. For instance, we will be supporting the fifth superstation in the coastal region later this week and possibly a sixth superstation in the coming weeks also, at the end of the week, we're opening another community pod in the city of Vista, and we're secure, securing a second vaccination location as part of the East County Vaccination Superstation Network. And more is still to come. Behind the scenes, we're expanding our information technology and data efforts. While the biggest factor in the availability of appointments is vaccine supply, we are working to make the process of signing up for an appointment more streamlined and easier with the expansion of the state's My Turn system. State has recently made it mandatory for all vaccine providers to use the MyTurn system or their electronic health record system. And this will make the user experience easier in the coming weeks. We're excited about a new community engagement vaccination appointment project designed to help those with language and technology barriers who are may be more hesitant to get vaccinated. We're piloting this project in the South region through our many community-based partners. And with that, and I would like to turn it over to Vince Nicoletti to discuss engagement with the business community. Vince. On August 4th, the county established the Safe Reopening Compliance Team to serve as the regional lead for complaints regarding possible violations of the public health order. To date, the team has received over 21,000 complaints working with cities across the region to address them. The team includes a call center that's staffed 24 seven for which complaints are anonymous and we respond to his emails as well. We've trained team members on approach with the intent of helping businesses and entities navigate the health order to come into compliance. This chart shows our average daily complaints each week since the team was created. Each bar represents the average number of complaints received each day of that week. The average daily complaints have ranged from 40 to 50 in the first few months. Following our move into the purple tier in November, daily complaints increased significantly, averaging two to 300. Since California lifted the stay at home order in late January, complaints have decreased back to roughly 100 a day. Since our last board update, compliance teams have reached out to those businesses that are now allowed to operate since the stay at home order was lifted. We've explained the changes of lifting the stay at home order, including what changes businesses could make to be in compliance, such as restaurants shifting to outdoor dining. 
We've conducted follow-up inspections for those locations that previously received cease and desist orders to confirm that they're now in compliance. When we observe that businesses are now in compliance, we adjust the online status of their cease and desist orders to mark them in compliance. The compliance team is also threading with FG3 on the Small Business Stimulus Grant Program. Per board direction, we're providing lists of those businesses or entities that are in violation of the health order as part of the eligibility review process for grants. This completes the update on compliance. Next, NEPs will speak to finance. Thanks, Vince. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and Supervisors. The County of San Diego continues to spend approximately $12.5 million a week for our county response, for our testing, tracing, and treatment, as well as our COVID income stipend program and the Great Plates Delivered program, as well as our vaccination efforts. And as more vaccines become available and as we ramp up, um, these costs will continue to rise. Now, at the last board meeting on January 26, I went over several funding opportunities that we are looking at to help cover these costs. It includes things from third-party insurance, including Medi-Cal for our vaccination efforts, uh, the governor's proposed budget, the federal stimulus funds under the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, also referred to as H.R. 133, and, of course, President Biden's proposed American Rescue Plan and FEMA. I'll provide just a quick update on new information we have received in some of these areas. Under H.R. 133, the federal stimulus bill passed in December. The state of California has now received almost $1.7 billion under H.R. 133 for COVID-enhancing detection expansion funding, which is purpose is to strengthen our public health infrastructure so we can address not only our current COVID pandemic, but also future pandemics. The funding can be used for, among other things, testing, tracing, investigations, containment, and mitigation, which includes our vaccination efforts. Now, we have been informed by the state that the county of San Diego will be allocated $123.8 million of these funds, and we are expected to receive further guidelines in the next couple of weeks from the state. These funds are for costs that are incurred between March of 2021, so next month, through July of 2023, so over the next couple of years. Also under H.R. 133, the county received a direct allocation from the U.S. Treasury of $48.8 million for a new rental assistance program, which your board provided us direction on the framework and the priorities for this program at the last meeting. What's new is that the state, also under H.R. 33, uh, 133 received a direct allocation of $1.5 billion in funding from the U.S. Treasury for rental assistance. The state has earmarked $52.5 million of these dollars that the County of San Diego can apply to the state for, and bringing into our county um, $101.3 million. But, of course, there are conditions the state is requiring to obtain these additional dollars, which in just a second, David Estrella is going to walk you through all the options that you'll have to consider. And of course, regarding uh, President Biden's proposed $1.9 billion stimulus plan, which you, you talked about earlier and some of your other items, we continue to monitor the activities at the federal level and we'll keep you apprised as things develop. And finally, we will be pursuing FEMA and we continue to assess how to best leverage these dollars under President Biden administration, FEMA has been authorized to cover 100% of select COVID pandemic costs, and this can be applied retroactively. Uh, FEMA is still working out the details and the guidance on how to, to apply these changes, so more to come in that area. So at this point, I'll turn it over to David Estrella. On real, real, real quick, uh, Andy, before we go to David, if I could just draw uh, the board's attention to uh, what David is about to walk us through. Uh, we're going to have to decide as a board at the end of the presentation which of these options we want to take um, as it relates to the rental assistance uh, efforts. Obviously, we have the federal funds, uh, which we'd already kind of discussed and decided. Now we have state funding on top of that. And, and there, there is a little bit of complexity between the two funds, overlapping jurisdictions, how we want to administer and run. And so David's going to walk through um, our options. But again, one, once we get to the end of the presentation, we're going to have to decide as a board, which one of these options we take. So I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to, uh, to, to this part of the presentation. David? Yes. Good afternoon. The Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021 
also known as HR 133, included $25 billion for emergency rental assistance for households economically impacted by COVID-19. Funds have been distributed and will be overseen by the U.S. Department of the Treasury. As a result of H.R. 133, the U.S. Treasury awarded approximately $49 million to the County of San Diego based on the population of the unincorporated area plus 16 cities and populations under 200,000. The City of San Diego received $42 million and Chula Vista received $8 million. The State of California also received $1.5 billion from the Treasury. Previously, the board provided direction on the use of the county's $49 million. In general, the board set a, des a design parameter of a six-month maximum award per application and set local prioritization for health equity and single-parent households. These local preference preferences would be in addition to the mandatory prioritization categories set by H.R. 133. Since the last board update, the state of California enacted SB 91. SB 91 sets aside a majority of the state's $1.5 billion allocation for local jurisdictions like San Diego County with a population of 200,000 or larger that received a direct allocation from the U.S. Treasury. The county's proportional amount of the state's $1.5 billion is estimated to be $52.5 million. The state has presented three basic options for local jurisdictions to access these funds. Option A is for the state to administer a single program in the county's jurisdiction. The county would direct its federal allocation of $49 million to the state, and the state would operate a, the program under the state's design. Option B would have the county administer a single program in the county's jurisdiction using both our federal funding and the state's allocation. The county would apply for a block grant from the state and the county would agree to administer the program in conformance with the state's design and within the state's timelines. Option C would have two separate and concurrent programs run by the state and the county serving the same jurisdiction for the same purpose but with different program designs. The cities of San Diego and the city of Chula Vista have allocations set aside by the state and are both considering these same options as well. As we discuss alignment within the region, it is important to note that there could be several programs operating in the region, depending on whether the county, the city of San Diego, and the city of Chula Vista choose to operate their own programs. The board is strongly committed to alignment of emergency rental assistance programs within the region to the greatest extent possible. Regardless of the option chosen by the county and the cities of Chula Vista and San Diego, the state's design will be implemented within the region in some form because the state's funding requires the state's design. This slide shows the key differences in the state and county designs. The state design includes mandatory federal prioritization for, of assistance for households with income at or below 50% area median income. For a family of four, this is an annual income of about $57,000. For a single person, about $40,000. Or that they have been unemployed for the 90-day period preceding their application. The second state prioritization includes communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 as determined by the state. In the county design, after the, mind, the mandatory 50% AMI and 90-day prioritization, the county prioritizes health equity and single parent households. Another key program design element is to highlight is the cap on arrears, on rental arrears, I'm sorry. Another key program design element is to highlight the cap on rental arrears. Under the state's design, if a landlord agrees to participate, the landlord may receive up to 80% of the rent owned by the tenant, and the landlord must agree to forgive the remaining 20%. If the landlord does not agree to participate, the tenant may receive up to 25% of the rent arrears amount. The county's designed would pay 100% rent arrears for up to six months. 
The state design also caps prospective rent at up to 25% of the rent amount. In comparison, county design is to provide 100% of the rent amount up to three months as, allow as allowed by HR 133. The state is still providing key information in two areas, documentation required and outreach to communities. In order to ensure proper use of funds, there will be some level of documentation required by the county to ensure eligibility requirements, such as income, renter status, and housing instability can be assessed. Accountability and use of funds and avoidance of fraud are strong considerations in determining acceptable forms of verification documentation. The state has issued guidance that local rental assistance programs that conform to the state design may not institute documentation standards that disadvantage vulnerable populations, such as requiring driver's licenses, formal leases, or documentation of citizenship. This could give some insight into how the state might implement their program. The county intends to leverage the extensive local community engagement network built in response to COVID-19 to help shape communication strategies and to outreach to hard to reach communities. The state has released high level information about community outreach that will be done by a selected education and communications contractor. Similar to the county, the state will develop culturally sensitive messaging, communications and program materials that are also seeking message alignment in the region. The state has indicated that their contractor will work with local jurisdictions and community-based organizations and will tailor messaging to meet local needs. SB 91 requires that the county submit an expression of an interest to the state by February 12th, indicating which option the county has chosen to access the state funds. If the county were to choose option B, accepting a block grant from the state and administering the program locally in conformance with state design, the county would have to award at least 65% of the $52.5 million in state funds to applicants by June 1 and expend all funds by August 1. The county would also have to meet the deadlines to have the federal allocation of $49 million awarded to applicants by September 30th and funds expected, expended by December 31st. Under option A, the state administers all funds. There would be consistency for landlords and tenants throughout at least 16 cities and the unincorporated area. The state would be responsible for administration of funds, program delivery, and ensuring duplication of benefits does not occur. Program delivery and outreach within the local area is tailored to meet local needs. This option has the least administrative burden to the county and will not require additional county staff resources. This option may serve more people as the state has restricted how much a landlord or tenant can receive per award. Preliminarily, the state has indicated that the state will incorporate local conforming prioritization into the state's local implementation. Now we'll look at option B. Under option B, the county takes all funding and must use all funding, both federal and state, in conformance with state design. In this option, the county must meet the stringent state expenditure timelines that are significantly shorter than federal requirements. Option B has the most administrative burden to the county and would require a significant effort to quickly hire staff, obtain, train, and equip the necessary staff to meet the state timelines. Additionally, county staff and IT resources would likely be required. Option A and B require conformance with state design, which would remove local designs of limiting to six months of assistance. Preferences for health equity and single parent households will likely conform, but are still subject to state approval. Option C would result in two separate and concurrent programs operating in the same area and providing the same type of assistance, but with different program designs. 
The county can administer its federal allocation according to local design, but under this option, the county takes on the burden of ensuring no duplication of benefits occurs. As the state has not provided concrete details as to how the data sharing between the local and the state will occur, this option poses a higher audit liability for the county. Having two concurrent programs may also result in confusion for landlords and tenants. The state had also noted that selection of option C may cause delayed payments to tenants and landlords because of the need to data share and ensure non-duplication of benefits. The state has strongly recommended jurisdictions choose between option A or B for the following reasons. Consistency for landlords and tenants throughout the state, stretching the resources to serve more household, avoidance of duplication of benefits, and program delivery within the local area will be tailored to meet local needs. Again, SB 91 requires that the county submit an expression of interest to the state by February 12th, indicating which option the county has chosen to access the state funds. The board is asked to choose one of the three options. This concludes the update on rental assistance. Back to you, Don. Thank you. Thanks, David. In addition to receiving this update, we recommend your board take the following additional four actions with respect to this item. First, ratify all actions previously taken in response to this local health emergency and local emergency, which shall include all agreements listed in attachment A and included in the errata, which include agreements with Tri-City Medical, Sweetwater Unified School District, Chula Vista Elementary School District, City of San Diego Fire Rescue, City of Chula Vista, and City of National City. These are new contracts specifically in support of vaccination efforts. The school districts in Tri-City are providing nurses and other staff that are able to administer vaccines at locations identified by T3 as needing these resources, including super stations and the smaller county pods. The city fire agencies listed in attachment A are mutual aid agreements, and these support vaccination efforts in skilled nursing facilities at smaller county pods and other vaccination events as needed. Next, ratify mutual aid agreements for vaccination services entered into by county fire with 12 fire agencies listed in attachment B and included in the errata. These are agreements are between county and Cal Fire as well as city fire agencies that are part of Operation Collaboration. Operation Collaboration is an effort led by county and Cal Fire to coordinate vaccine events with other city fire agencies. These agencies provide paramedics, EMTs at locations identified by T3 as needing these resources, including super stations, smaller county pods, and other vaccination events as needed. We anticipate additional school districts and mutual aid agreements coming online in support of vaccination efforts over the next few weeks. And next, authorize the auditor controller to establish a trust fund for emergency rental assistance program with interest earned to be retained in the trust fund. And finally, take any other action necessary to address the COVID-19 pandemic emergency response. Subject to your questions, this concludes our presentation. Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you to the, uh, the entire staff uh, for, the, for the presentation. Um, obviously, the kind of standard COVID update uh, we have, we can certainly have discussion on any of the items here. Um, I just wanna take a moment to thank our fire service in particular, one of the reasons as a county that we are leading the state. Uh, yesterday, the governor was here uh, and he highlighted, and it's true again today, that San Diego County has administered more vaccines per person than any large county in California. Uh, and that is in, in part due to the incredible work of setting up these locations and these stations rapidly and quickly and getting vaccines in arms. Uh, but a key component of that was the early decision uh, to vaccinate EMTs and firefighters so that they could become vaccinators. Uh, obviously, we have significant challenges in healthcare staffing and the availability of healthcare workers, uh, and they are categories of healthcare workers who uh, are eligible and allowed to be vaccinators. And so, by creating them, we increased our workforce, uh, which allowed us to stand up more stations and, and do more vaccines. And so, I'm very grateful to all of our healthcare partners uh, who are working with us at various pods uh, and the incredible work uh, that has gone into getting us uh, in, a, in a strong position. And obviously, we continue to await increased uh, supply. Um, having said that, I think that the, obviously the biggest item 
as a board that we need to discuss and decide on in addition to anything uh, that any of you all would like to bring up is the analysis of options on rental assistance. I think it's pretty clear we have option A and option B. Uh, option C is not uh, a good option. I don't think anyone recommends or suggests that. It'd be conflicting duplicative programs. Uh, but do we basically want the state to administer the totality of the rental assistance programs uh, or do we want to do it uh, understanding there's some complexity between the federal funds uh, and the state funds and having to work through that um, with the other jurisdictions in San Diego County who are also receiving these funds. So with that, let me stop and uh, just open it up to uh, my colleagues to see if anyone has any general comments or thoughts or if there's any uh, strong feeling on uh, which direction we would want to go on rental assistance. And Sheriff Fletcher, I'll also note that we have members of the public that have requested to speak in this. Oh, already. how many How many public speakers? It uh, looks like we, we had 15 requests so far. Um, we've got about four or five of those that have called in. All right, why don't, we, why don't we do the four or five? Let's hear from the public and then we'll come back and discuss with the board. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Also note for the record that we received 294 e-comments on this item. As, in, as I indicated, we had 15 requests to speak on this item. For those individuals that requested to speak on item two, please dial into the conference on now using the instructions provided to you. We will be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your phone. Each caller will be asked to state their name for the audio record, and you will have two minutes to address the board. You'll hear this sound when your time is up, so please conclude your comments at that time. Erin, if you could please identify the first caller. Thank you. Our first caller is 4978. 4978. Good afternoon. This is Richard Golden. Vaccines alone will not significantly reduce RRT for several more months. We need local governments to suppress and contain programs which will provide better outcomes. One of those is surveillance testing. Surveillance testing is a key to a lot of other programs as early identification of pre-symptomatic cases results in early isolation, tracing, treatment, and temporary lodging. Breaking chains of silent transmission reduces our case rates. County-run centers operate at 20% capacity or under. We must get individuals from medium risk activities there and not miss this opportunity. Or we could just surveillance test entire high prevalence zip codes and cities. They are all shown in dark purple on the COVID watch. You can exclude all who got vaccinated or infected in the past nine months and all who do truly great distancing. That way you get the benefit of surveillance testing an entire city, but you only use 30% of the resources. Whatever the roots, right groups are, we must get moving. Rapid testing. We must acquire 2 million county controlled rapid tests for special purpose surveillance testing. By reducing the prevalence, that will also allow us to do a higher percentage of genome sequencing. With B1351 and worse, we must be prepared to use all available resources for any pro problem outbreak. It is in our interest to eliminate or greatly reduce those outbreaks. There is no national plan. It is up to the local leaders. What is your plan for surveillance testing? What is your plan to quickly obtain enough county controlled rapid tests? What is your plan when a super problem variant outbreak occurs? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next caller is 5700. 5700. Hi, my name is Xiaowei, and I am an organizer with CPI and the ISDF Coalition. I'm speaking today to urge the Board of Supervisors to choose option B of the state law of SB 91 by accepting both state and federal rental assistance funding program. It is great to see that there is more funding to support renters and landlords, and many folks are in need of support. However, we are also advocating the following suggestion. Local coordination and local administration of the program create a system that prioritizes small landlords local data and tracking to ensure that corporate landlords are not double dipping by getting PPP and other assistance and getting access to these funds. 
Also, to ensure that landlords that are out of compliance with health standards do not get rewarded for poor living conditions. And a high level of coordination with all the cities in the San Diego County so that there will be one program to avoid confusion for the tenants. These are the lessons we learned from the last year rental assistance program. And if these suggestions are in, in, I'm sorry, implemented, it will ensure tenants get the relief and would hold bad landlords accountable to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 5302. 5302. Um, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Miriam Goff. Vivo en la ciudad de Chula Vista y soy miembro de ACE. Hola, buenas tardes. Un segundito, por favor. Ahora, okay. ahora sí, ¿puede repetir, por favor, su nombre? Mi nombre es Miriam Goff. Vivo en la ciudad de Chula Vista. Y soy miembro de ACE e INVEST en San Diego Families. Le insisto a votar por la opción B de SB91 para aceptar los programas de asistencia de renta estatales y federales. Okay, my name is Miriam Ross. I live in Chula Vista. I'm a member of ACE as well as Invest in San Diego Families. I am asking you today to vote for option B um, regarding the rental assistance programs for low-income families. Adelante. También les pido que apoyen las sugerencias de ACE y de ISDF para garantizar que los inquilinos obtengan la ayuda que necesitan y asegurar que los caseros malos lo hagan lo correcto. I also ask you to support the suggestions made by ACE and ISDF um, to support renters and make sure that uh, that bad landlords um, are doing what they should be doing instead of what they are doing. Necesitamos asegurarnos que, primero, exista coordinación local y administración local del programa. Necesitamos poder hablar con alguien local sobre preocupaciones para el alivio de renta. We need to make sure that there is, uh, before anything else, local coordination for these programs so that there's somebody locally that we can reach out to when we have questions or need assistance. Uh, segundo, haya datos locales y seguimiento sobre quién está solicitando Necesitamos saber quién está solicitando y asegurarnos de que los caseros malos no estén doblegando a las personas que eh, están eh, necesitan alivio en la renta y que puedan presentar una solicitud. Um, second, we need to make sure that we have good data for the local programs and, and, and we're following up to make sure um, that we have the information to find out who is applying and making sure that, that, that bad landlords aren't preventing tenants from being able to apply or receive aid. Tercero, coordinar con todas las ciudades de San Diego para que haya un programa y nadie se confunda. El año pasado, el condado y la ciudad de San Diego tenían sus propios programas de asistencia para el alquiler con diferentes requisitos. Third, coordinate um, with all the cities in the county so that there is one program and people aren't confused. Last year, the city of San Diego had their own rental assistance program, and it was hard to distinguish who qualified for what and what the requirements were. Esto fue compuso, confuso y muchas personas fueron descalificadas. Por las ciudades abrieron sus programas en diferentes momentos y fueron descalificadas de programa de condado. Gracias. This was confusing and led to people being disqualified from being able to be eligible for the city programs as well as for county programs. So we would ask um, that it not be as confusing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 8688. 8688. Um, hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. And what I wanted to talk about um, that your staff didn't really talk about much is the free FEMA hotels. We have 100% reimbursement for FEMA hotels. I believe you might also be missing out on transit occupancy tax for these hotel rooms that could come in as new revenue. We have this new revenue stream that you're not maximizing. Currently, um, you know, I, I tweeted to all of you that there's only two of the 33 hotels that are open that could be op used for the homeless. Um, any hotel could actually sign up with FEMA to be a hotel to welcome these people in. You, um, all you're missing is county staff to run these 
projects or to um, give out to other people to, to run it. Plus, running it is 100% reimbursable. So are three meals a day. Why are all these people homeless out on the street that have, um, you know, issues? And then you, there's also, you know, information sheet. So people that are high risk, people that are coming out of the hospitals, you literally have free FEMA money for the next eight months until January, um, excuse me, until September 30th, 2021, to get these people in the stable condition. Everybody over age 65 who's homeless can be helped if you help them. Please, please help them. I don't know what to do. We've been, we've been begging you, and now we have this fabulous, wonderful opportunity. All we need is somebody in leadership to say to your staff, Get all these hotel rooms, get every single person who has a high-risk condition, including cancer, immune-compromised, kidney disease, COPD, heart condition, severe obesity, pregnancy. Any pregnant woman who's out there could actually get a hotel room for the next eight months. Anybody who's over 65 could get a free hotel room. People who have hypertension or high blood pressure. Please help all these people. And what you have to do is hire more staff. So you do have to hire staff, um, you know, hire as many people as you can. Thank you so much. Please do something. Thank you. And that concludes public testimony on this item, Chair Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, with that, let's go to uh, any board member comments or discussions in particular. Uh, any thoughts around option A versus option B on, uh, on rental um, assistance? And let me see here. I see Supervisor... Uh, Vargas, then Supervisor Desmond, then Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Supervisor Vargas? Yes. Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. I wanted to thank uh, the county staff for the continued work on COVID 19 mitigation. And I'll get to the item on, on rental in a minute, but I wanted just to say thanks for uh, prioritizing and ensuring that uh, the vaccination process is efficient and accessible. And I know there's a lot of questions around equity and and uh, eligibility and, and what's happening. So I just want to recognize um, that they really are focused on, uh, especially our older, older population, and, and that we've heard loud and clear, and we've said it a couple of times, that um, trying to make appointments for our, our uh, older population has been tough. And so I want to thank the county for taking this information back to my turn so that they, some things can change uh, and make it a little bit easier for folks, um, especially those that don't have access to technology and the, the language barrier continues. I also want to say thank you to um, the folks who have been working really hard to make sure that our Promotora pilot program um, actually is launched. Um, I think that we've heard the Promotora program and or uh, Navigator pro program, right, is um, this pro pilot program that's going to be focused in the South Bay for now that hopefully we'll be able to expand throughout the county. Uh, really is going to reach the vulnerable communities, especially seniors over 65, and help them secure appointments, specifically uh, block appointments for these efforts. And so I, I'm really grateful for that, for working for, with my team on that. And I know that it's going to have a positive impact, and I really want us to start pushing so the numbers for the Latino community, African-American community, Filipino community, Asian community start changing. And I know that um, we're still in phase one. We're still focusing on seniors of 65 and older, but um, this is, like many of you, a priority, and I know that we shared that with the governor yesterday, uh, Chair Fletcher. And so with regards to the rental relief program, I, I think that uh, I know that it was a really quick turnaround to make this decision, and I really appreciate county staff and my team working together. But after reviewing um, and understanding more about the intention of the state program, I'm, I would like to recommend that we support option B. Um, I understand that, um, you know, there, I, I think this will help actually reduce the confusion and tension from some tenants, and we've heard from some of the folks today online about this. Um, we have two programs with different outcomes, and it creates a lot of confusion and tension, uh, and it creates other problems, I think. And so um, the one thing I did want to say that in order to make things fair uh, and treat um, both pots of fund the same, I think option B would be the best recommendation, uh, uh, in, you know, as I look at it. But I, was at, I would like to also ask the county to administer a local program because we need to ensure that no additional barriers are added to our communities. Any into, uh, rental relief administer from the county will uh, be open to um, anyone, regardless of stat status. And uh, I want to make sure we centralize the pots of funds into one website portal and it allows folks to really experience a simple process. Uh, we would like to really, I would like to really ask for additional data to be collected in order to ensure equitable distribution of the funds. And I know this is not part of that, but I would like to ask staff to do this, is, which is really the collection of data 
uh, that allows us to uh, go back to the state and reassess the program if additional funding comes again. And so with that, I would like to ask that we also include um, uh, data. So this is not an amendment, but a request for additional data on a uh, number of Section 8 voucher holders on properties, demographic information of ownership and tenants, number of tenants across portfolios that were unable to pay, actual cost during pandemic period, actual cost 12 months before the pandemic, whether they apply for and receive paycheck protection from federal government, were there any um, outstanding code violations and were they raised, were they raised to rent over the last 18 months? And so I know it's additional information that I would like to make sure that we ask, um, you know, it's data that be um, gathered as we move forward. And so again, thank you for the, for the, to the staff for um, all the research and the work. And so I will be voting to support um, the core requested actions. And um, I, my recommendation would be to support option B for the rental relief program. Thank you. We'll take that as a motion to approve the recommendations with option B for rental assistance. And we'll continue our discussion. Um, I'm happy to uh, to second that. Um, Supervisor Desmond, and then we'll go to Supervisor okay. Lawson Reamer and then Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate that. I just wanted, I guess, a clarification. And, and I'm okay with item B, I think, uh, or, or choosing a B. I know it's gonna bring, um, bring on more staff and potentially more jobs for people in San Diego County, particularly those that are, are, aren't able to work right now. Um, I do, I, I th as far as the status of, I guess, as a personal uh, legal status or not here in the country, if we do op any of these options, essentially we have to do what's required by the state and the state doesn't allow us to look at those. Is that, is that correct uh, from our uh, attorney? Supervisor Desmond, members of the board, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I just really wanted to say thank you to staff. I'm always just wowed, you know, with these presentations that you put forward and how much time and effort and how many people it takes to coordinate and make all this logistics and make everything work with the vaccinations and and just, you know, and, and I, I see it being rolled out in the unincorporated areas as well. It's just, uh, you know, fantastic with what, what you're doing. Um, I would like to, though to ask, I know last uh, board meeting we had a, uh, a board of supervisors unanimously approved a motion to prioritize working with the state uh, to open up youth sports. I was wondering if there's any progress on that, if that's still in work, or if anyone right. could speak to uh, any efforts to prioritize that uh, the youth sports uh, with the state. I can, I can comment on that, Supervisor Desmond. I've spoken uh, directly to the governor uh, several times, to Secretary Galley. Uh, to Jim Debu, along with members of that coalition, multiple times, and I think that there is progress being made, and uh, and I think we should we should probably uh, leave it there. But I think that there is there is some progress that's being made right now. Use some youth sports are open for competitions in the purple tier and the red. Uh, I know there's a desire to make some adjustments to that, uh, and I think there is some positive collaborative energy uh, that is moving in that direction. And and I hope I hope soon we can uh, we can see some progress. But I have taken seriously. Uh, what we're doing, and I have fulfilled the commitment of, of what we would do and continue to do that uh, again as early as this morning before our board meeting started. So well, we'll I appreciate your efforts on this. I, I, I do, and, and say thank you very much. I'm just wondering, we directed staff to do this. Is staff also, are, are, you, are, you, are they giving it to you to do or is staff doing something in, in also or what's well, the- uh, if, if anyone on staff has a governor's cell phone and wants to call him and talk to him, but I think I'm probably in the best position to speak directly with the governor, with Secretary Galley, and with senior members of their team to work on this. So I don't, I don't feel like anyone's burdened me with, with work that they, 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 they could be doing. Okay, well, I guess we had asked staff to look into it, so that was, I was curious if they had anything me, in addition to add to what you had. Uh, let me just add that um, I have raised this through the um, kitchen cabinet that I serve on, and then also uh, Gary Johnson has been in regular contact uh, every day, actually, with um, his counterparts up at the state uh, to work this specific issue. So we are absolutely diligently working to try to help you sports. Thank you. Well, and, and thanks to staff and to Supervisor Chair Fletcher for your for your efforts on this. I know we all we all would like to see it uh, sooner rather than later. But I'm in fully in support of B, the local control. I think uh, this gives us more opportunities. I know it's going to be a little bit harder on staff. And for the landlords to give up 20% of the rent is, you know, a, a burden. But uh, I think this is a, you know, it's a great amount of money that uh, it's a great, op a, a great thing that we have to decide upon is how do we uh, help people with, you know, over uh, $50 million worth of rental assistance coming into San Diego County. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Supervisor Lawson-Reamer. 
Uh, yeah, I, um, I would like to agree with uh, Vice Chair Vargas um, as well as Supervisor Desmond on option B on the rental assistance, uh, but with a couple amendments. Um, I do think we did a, a good job of thinking thoughtfully about how to make our program accessible um, as well as uh, sort of including priorities to in, um, uh, have considerations around equity. So uh, my, my uh, recommendation would be to select option two with uh, five amendments, uh, actually, sorry, four amendments. Um, so first part would be uh, the way that the program was described, there's a round one prioritization uh, below 50% of AMI, uh, second was below 80%, and then around, add around three prioritization, which would be uh, to include our health, health equity prioritization um, using the Healthy Places Index and include prioritization for single parent households. Uh, both of these prioritizations with, would be consistent with the program design that we approved at the last meeting. Uh, so this again, wouldn't uh, undo or wouldn't contravene uh, anything in the state's program, but would just layer on top um, the considerations we had previously decided. Uh, secondly, I just wanna in, uh, ensure that we have an option for alternative forms of personal identification, um, including ID cards and passports uh, issued by the Mexican government. Um, the third is making sure we have translation services for application documents, um, including Spanish, Arabic, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and Chinese. And then the fourth is to include additional, uh, a few additional questions um, to gather data. And this is again to sort of echo and, and build upon uh, what uh, Vice Chair Vargas uh, put forth uh, to better understand landlord portfolio, tenant demographics, and the receipt of PPP loans. Let me just ask David real quick. Um, David, I, I assume a lot of that is is built in. I just want to know if that's if those are all things we're doing or if we need to include it in the in the motion um, or if there are things that are built into the program. We, we could do either. So Supervisor, um, the, the key to the prioritizations is to make sure that they're approved by the um, state of California. That's the number one thing. The um, data gathering and the uh, other additions, as uh, the state has been very clear that, that uh, local jurisdictions should not add barriers uh, to participation. I don't believe the questions uh, as described by the supervisors would be barriers. Um, one note, the, the, the streamlining of applications and the, the quickness with which we spend funding is, um, in, in other words, we try to incentivize for, for renters and landlords to participate. So we try to have as, as few questions as possible to still achieve our goals. Um, but I believe, uh, based on what's being described, that we can do that. And yeah, I just uh, want to uh, clarify and confirm that I am very much focused on making this as streamlined as possible, which is why looking at alternative forms of identification um, and, you know, maybe we make answering questions optional so that people, uh, there's not a barrier to apply based on um, needing to answer questions. So, you know, I think the intent here is to make things as streamlined as possible, uh, gather data to the extent feasible without creating any additional barriers, um, and then to just uh, make sure that this new uh, formulation, which now uh, adopts the state uh, requirements, also, um, uh, to the extent feasible, uh, incorporates consideration of um, health equity uh, as uh, Vice Chair Vargas uh, was championing on uh, last meeting, as well as um, prioritizing single parent families. Thank you, Supervisor. The uh, verifications that you were describing, as far as we can tell with the state in our discussions, are, are allowable and can be implemented. And uh, definitely we will work with, with uh, your staff to accomplish that. All right, anything else? Supervisor Anderson. Thank you. Um, I like uh, option B, but I was uh, concerned that the June 1st window is so short that uh, perhaps not all the money will be distributed and not everybody will be uh, helped. Um, may, may I ask staff, if they have any concerns about meeting that obligation, because if we don't use all the money, that means that some of our constituents uh, will miss that opportunity. And I, I don't want anybody, to, I don't want any of that money not to go to those in, in need. 
Thank you for your question, Supervisor. This is David. So definitely that is a concern, that aggressive time schedule from the state to expend 65% of the funds by June 1. Um, to mitigate that, the, the county will, will have to hire staff, uh, you know, uh, hire staff, retain them, train them, provide them the necessary uh, materials to work. Uh, and there is a risk of recapture if those funds are not uh, appropriately expended by those expenditure deadlines. So uh, it is a concern and definitely, of course, the, the county team is prepared to uh, follow the board's wishes and implement your policies, but th that will be a, um, a challenge for us and we will have to uh, dedicate a great deal of resources into make those goals. The cost of uh, distributing the, these funds, does it come from the funds or does it come from our general fund? How does that work? Uh, when addressing it? Yes, there is administrative fees associated with both uh, funds, both federal and state. It's a 10% administrative fee that's allowable under the federal program and 8.5% allowable under the state program. Um, as we anticipate now, the administrative funding will most likely cover a great portion of the staffing costs necessary to administer the program. Um, but as we see a response to the program and uh, the um, quickness in which we spend funds, uh, we'll, we'll have to, to adjust accordingly. I know that all our super stations and all the work we're doing on vaccines has taken a lot of bandwidth. Uh, is that of any concern? Do you think that they'll eat into each other as far as our ability to get moving and, and meet the goals? Supervisor, um, we certainly have uh, stretched our bandwidth to its maximum. The stimulus grants, this tracing, vaccination, uh, countless things, no doubt about it. But we don't have a choice, and we will make this happen. Uh, so let me be very clear on that. Uh, and to the extent that um, we can't do this within that 10% administrative fee, we would certainly come back to the board and let you all know that. But right now, our goal is to live within that uh, allocation that we have received to administer this this uh, uh, funding and to do it on the timelines. I would suggest that um, we talk to our delegation about possibly amending uh, SB 91 uh, to see if we could get some relief on those deadlines. Um, so I just throw that out there as a possibility uh, to help give us a little bit more time but uh, we are not going to assume that. At this point, we're going to go full speed ahead at the board's direction. Thank you. I, I, my only concern is the timeline in not fulfilling uh, the obligations by the timeline and allowing money to be recaptured that could have gone to rent. But uh, if we're up to the task, uh, certainly uh, more local jobs, uh, more control over it is a good thing. So. Good. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Anderson. So I think uh, we have a motion and a second to adopt the five COVID recommendations, uh, making clear as a county we will go with option B, county administering state and federal funds. Uh, again, with the uh, understanding that, that we will uh, align prioritization based on the healthy equity index, the single parent households, uh, allow for alternative forms of identification ensure translation services and consistent with what uh, Supervisor Vargas and Watson Reamer uh, outlined around data uh, collection and analysis on the back end. Um, so with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, not seeing any other comments, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I also note that that recommendation includes the uh, RADA and the amendments to the approval of the contracts that were noted during the presentation. With that, uh, Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Let's try. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, we're going to go to agenda item number four. This is authorized application for and accepting of funding for transitional housing program. Uh, I think this is a, a, a wonderful program and a, and a good effort. Uh, let me ask the clerk if we have a request for public comment on item four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had one request to speak on this item. Uh, we'll wait for that individual to call in to the conference line now. Okay. We'll 
we'll give them uh, one more minute to see if they call in. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just received a text message. The person uh, believes they mistakenly signed up for item four. <laughs> All right. So with that, I'll make a motion to uh, approve item four. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right. Motion by myself, second by uh, Vice Chair Vargas. Any board member comments or discussions on item four? All right. We will ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Thank you. Supervisor Anderson? All right. Yeah. Supervisor lawson Reamer. Eight. I'm Aye. Supervisor yeah. Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, we'll move to uh, two items left. We'll go to uh, agenda item uh, number eight, uh, which is uh, analysis extending current rental relief programs um, and removing uh, lien requirements. Um, I, uh, I know uh, Supervisor Vargas has a request to speak on this. Uh, let me ask in, uh, in one second here our CAO if she would like to make any introductory comments to this item or if she'd like us to just go uh, into public comment and board, board discussion. All right, I'll ask the clerk if there's any requests for public comment. There are no requests to speak on this item. Oh, pardon okay. me. There is one request to speak on this item, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, let's hear the public speaker, and then we'll go to Supervisor Vargas, Supervisor Lawson Reamer, and then continue on. We are waiting for that individual to call into the conference line now. Again, this is item number eight. So for the individual who requested to speak on item eight, please dial in now. While we're right. reading, I'll note for the record that we received one e-comment on this item. All right. Why don't we go to, to board discussion on this item? We'll start with Supervisor Vargas and then go to Supervisor Watson Reamer. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the January 26th board meeting, I think if you might remember, I was supportive of the adoption of this ordinance to adopt the two uh, proposed amendments as it related to the virtual applications and 30 day to execute the lien. And additionally, during that meeting, I was supportive of an analysis that would further explore the feasibility of eliminating the requirement for a lien. And so I wanna thank county staff and county council for looking into this matter and providing an analysis. The analysis noted that the average amount of the county collected is about $46,000 per year. And it's an average of 51 collected general relief program liens. So this data to me shows that not only uh, a very small fraction of individuals that receive assistance through this program are able to pay back the amount that they were provided at one point. It is clear that these folks also are seeking assistance because of need and our, and our you know, taking advantage of the system. So as a county, we need to be uplifting people. And personally, this lien requirement seems to be penalizing people that are able to get, a, you know, aren't able to get ahead. So by having them pay back the amount that was provided to them when they really needed it, I think um, it is really not the best way to go. So because of these reasons, I'm inclined to remove this lien requirement overall. I really want to thank uh, everyone for the work that they did on this and I'm supportive of the requested actions and uh, would like to also direct the CAO to work with appropriate staff to come back to the board with an ordinance that would eliminate the lien requirement from the general relief program. Okay. Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Um, yeah, I actually just want to build on and, and, um, and maybe even be a bit more, uh, you know, just uh, amplify uh, what Supervisor uh, Vargas had said. I really appreciated her focus on the lean program. I completely agree with her analysis that this program is unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily burdensome on people who are, you know, least uh, positioned to to pay back the money, and in, and indeed. Uh, costs potentially costs us more as a county uh, in staff time to administer the program than it than it actually uh, 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 returns in terms of um, in terms of funds that are recuperated. So, uh, if from a cost benefit perspective as well as a human rights perspective, it's I think this lean program has to go. Um, and I, honestly, I don't think we need to wait. Um, it seems pretty simple. I think we should just get rid of it. Uh, we can get rid of amend and replace section two sixty one subsection B of the code. Uh, to just strike out that last line where it uh, imposes a lien. So it would just read 
um, as follows. Uh, notwithstanding the provisions of subsection A of the section, the director may grant general relief to an applicant or recipient household owning real property where, but for the ownership of such property, the applicant or recipient would not otherwise be eligible and extreme hardship would result if general relief were not granted. And uh, at the same time, amend section 263 as follows, uh, which is to delete the title and retitle this section assignment of claims and then delete in their entirety subsections A and subsection C uh, and then finally return for a second reading at our next meeting on March 2nd. Um, you know, in other words, I think uh, Supervisor Vargas is completely right and we need to move forward expeditiously to get rid of this uh, lien program. Uh, thank you. I, I think we're all in agreement on what we want to do. Let me ask County Council or CAO, is it possible to uh, amend on the fly and have this be uh, a first reading and then come back for a second reading? Supervisor Fletcher, uh, members of the board, yes, that is possible. And the language that Supervisor Lawson Reamer read in, um, as part of the motion would be acceptable with that becoming a first reading of the revised ordinance and then the ordinance returning um, for the March 2nd meeting as a sec at, for a second reading. Awesome. So should we count that as a motion from Supervisor Lawson Reamer and a with the language that was read, I believe the clerk has, and uh, Mass Supervisor Vargas, if she'd like to second that, it's removal of the lien. Yes, I'll second. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other board member comments? Supervisor Desmond. Just real briefly, uh, you know, I, I agree that we should probably get rid of this. Um, what was brought up last week, I thought it was, you know, kind of a thing to, uh, you know, if, if people do good and if they, uh, the lien on the house didn't seem to be like so much of a burden, but it's costing us more to uh, probably go after these dollars than it is, uh, than it is worth it. So uh, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Lawson Reamer, a second by Vice Chair Vargas. Uh, seeing no other requests for comment, uh, I would ask the clerk to restate the motion uh, as amended. Uh, the changes to the ordinances will constitute our first reading, uh, and if approved by the board, then we'll come back for our second reading. So I'd ask him to restate the uh, changes and, uh, and then call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Uh, the changes include an amendment and replacing section 261, subsection B of the proposed ordinance, which would read, notwithstanding the provisions of subsection A of the section, the director may grant general relief to an applicant or recipient household owning real property where, but for the ownership of such property, the applicant or recipient household would otherwise be eligible and extreme hardship would result in general relief were not granted. And then amend section 263 to delete the title and retitle the section assignment of claims and delete in its entirety subsections A and C and then return to the board for a second reading on March 2nd, 2021. All right, let's call the roll. Thank you. With that, Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. Thank you. We're gonna to go to our final uh, agenda item for today, uh, agenda item 14. Uh, this was a late docket uh, brought forward by Supervisor uh, Anderson. I'm going to kick it to Supervisor Anderson to uh, introduce the item. But before we do that, um, just to update the, the board and public who's watching in terms of where we are in vaccines. Uh, we obviously did healthcare workers first. We got to a critical uh, shortage of, of, of healthcare uh, available ICU beds in particular uh, down in the low single digit staffed and available. The real problem was staffed beds. And we were losing healthcare workers at a rapid rate to COVID. And when you lose an ICU nurse, uh, you may also lose everyone that that nurse has been in close contact with. So you could wipe out an entire shift uh, of healthcare workers. And so I think everyone uh, took the same action to move forward with doing healthcare workers first. Uh, when healthcare workers were not consuming all of the available appointments, we opened it up to seniors 75 and older. Uh, seniors, uh, represent 90% of our, of our COVID deaths. And so we opened up there. When they didn't take all the appointments, we opened to senior 65 and older. Um, and that's where we are working through right now. Um, I know that there is a great desire uh, on the part of a great number of groups uh, who wanna get vaccinated now. Uh, I can say that I want everyone to get vaccinated now as well. 
Uh, the challenge in front of us in the discussion we're going to have here here in the in the in next is around do we continue to make sure we vaccinate seniors or do we uh, make a recommendation to start vaccinating a younger and healthier workforce? And unfortunately, right now we have limited supply and we're still continuing to work through vaccinating seniors. Uh, we are able to be the leader in the state of California in number of vaccines administered because we made the decision to vaccinate EMTs and paramedics uh, because they have the ability to become vaccinators. Uh, and that was the reason why they were included in healthcare was to increase our workforce so we could staff all of these sites and operations. But again, I certainly understand and respect everyone's uh, desire to get immediately vaccinated, uh, but that's kind of where we are and that's the, the uh, decision we have to decide as a board. Um, with that, let me kick it to uh, Supervisor Anderson and then we'll go to public comment and then come back for board deliberation. Uh, uh, Chair Fletcher, when I submitted the letter, uh, I, I recommended directing the CAO since then. That's not really what I'm trying to accomplish. And if it's appropriate, I'd like to read what I should have written. Uh, and that is to recommend that the public health officer treat law enforcement like other first responders, such as firefighters and lifeguards in the county's vaccination plan and uh, take the necessary steps to ensure that they have prompt access to COVID-19 vaccines. Right. In the beginning, we addressed it to the CAO. Uh, that was inappropriate. It, it's a recommendation to uh, the health officer. I believe that that's more correct. But, no, 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 yeah, that's fine. But so you're striking, obviously direct the CAO is to recommend to the right. health officer, but is it still to move law enforcement personnel to the 1A tier? Well, what it, so I don't want to get caught up in the tiers. The goal is to prioritize law enforcement. And let me just go through uh, my school of thought. We have fewer than 4,000 law enforcement, which equates to uh, what we do. We do more than that in one day. Uh, with just a super station down at Par uh, Petco, I know that we had a day of 3,000. We may have actually even hit 4,000. You'd know better than I on that. But uh, our, when we think in terms of firefighters, they're physically fit, they're young, and they have an essential service and in addition to their, their first responders. So when my house is on fire and I call uh, 911, I want that firefighter to be there capable of putting the fire out. If they weren't vaccinated, there's a likelihood that they may take it back to the firehouse COVID could potentially be spread and we'll have uh, too few firefighters to give us adequate protection. When I go to the beach and I'm swimming and I, and I get in trouble with the riptide, uh, we know that uh, our lifeguards are physically fit, they're up to the demands and they're able to swim out to us and, and save us. And that's important. And they're first responders uh, in that circumstance and they, give CPR. But we also know that in 2020, over 10,000 medical aid calls were done by our law enforcement in the county. And uh, when someone's breaking in my house and I call 911, uh, I don't wanna see a firefighter or a lifeguard, not because they aren't terrific people and aren't terrific, but I want law enforcement to show up. And my concern is uh, they, give CPR, uh, their first responders, in many cases, clearly 10,000 medical cases last year, there were first responders to accidents and other emergencies. And for them to get at, cr at critical levels because they're responding to COVID and taking it back to their substation or to their station, and we may not have enough uh, of those law enforcement to do their job and protect our citizens. So from my perspective, whatever we can do to expedite getting them there, and we're talking about fewer than 4,000, but in terms of impact on the communities I represent, uh, uh, what, you know, I said this before, one of the cities I have is the second poorest city in the county. And uh, law enforcement plays a very critical role in that community. And if they, if they're, uh, struck down by COVID, uh, yes, they, you know, like 
firefighters and other physically fit young people, they're not likely to die, but others may die because they weren't there to protect them or to provide uh, the services. That second uh, poorest city in my district has some of the highest crime. They really can't afford not to have those protections. And so that's what I'm asking the board to do is say, how is it that firefighters and lifeguards, while they're critically important, how can we possibly exclude our law enforcement uh, when they are critical to many parts of the county? I, I think I think Supervisor Anderson, in just important context, firefighters were not vaccinated because they put out fires. Well, I would have vaccinated them for that reason. Well, I, <laughs> you know? I appreciate that, but that's not why they were vaccinated. They were vaccinated because they are able to become vaccinators. They can staff the vaccine sites and administer those. So if there's any law enforcement officer out there that is an EMT or a paramedic, we would joyfully vaccinate them if they would agree to be a part of our vaccinator program. So they, they weren't vaccinated because they are firefighters. They were vaccinated so that we could increase the healthcare workforce of people who can give the shots. Because we increase the healthcare workforce of people who can give the shots, we've stood up more sites than anyone else in the state of California. And we've administered more vaccines than anyone else in the state of California which means we're protecting more folks. And if we were to do one, and I want law enforcement to get it now. I want teachers to get it now. I want a lot of people to get it now. And law enforcement and teachers are in the very first group of essential workers, the very first group of essential workers. Um, but to do them now, and, this will, and we'll discuss and see which way the majority of the board wants to recommend. Again, we can't direct, but recommend. But that would mean 4,000 senior citizens who can die from COVID would not get the vaccine. So and, and, and that's that now we, we very well in the coming week. I don't know. We don't know when we will get through it being it doesn't mean every senior has to be vaccinated. It means it has to be offered. Right. And, 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 and they have to do it. So we don't know the demand. We don't know the supply. But when every appointment is not being filled by a senior, then we will open up this next year of essential workers. But to do it today, um, again, would be taking a vaccine away from a senior. And the, you know that senior that COVID can be a death sentence. It's ninety percent of our deaths. And that younger, healthier worker, you know, we want to we want everyone to get it. But that that's really the choice. And so why firefighters and happened at the beginning was to build out the workforce. Now we can vaccinate law enforcement, but they cannot become a vaccinator unless they're an EMT or a paramedic. And so uh, again, it's fair fair point for discussion. But I, I just think it's it's uh, it's important to understand that context and also understand. Uh, where we are. I will also tell you that seniors uh, make up the majority of the COVID hospitalizations and, and we need those hospitalizations down. That, that's what helps increase our ability to get our businesses back up and running and advance through the, the things that we're doing. But can you, Supervisor Anderson, just so we're clear, can you just restate for us uh, what, what your, your recommendation is just so we're all on the same page and then sure. uh, I, I know we have some public comment on this as well. Sure. Uh, before I uh, repeat it again though, I, it's important to know that there are 27 counties that are already doing this. That is true. Amador, Butte, Conicastra, uh, El uh, Dorado, Fresno, Humboldt, Kings, Lake, Marin, Merced, um, uh, Monterey, Napa, Nevada, Orange, Placer, uh, Riverside, Sacramento, San Bernardino, San Juan King, uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, Shasta, Solano, Sonoma, Stanislaus, Tehama, uh, Tulare and Ventura. So there are other counties that are moving forward with this, but my my motion would be recommend that the public health officer treat law enforcement like other first responders, such as lifeguards and uh, firefighters in the county's vaccination plan and take necessary steps to ensure they have prompt access to COVID vaccines. I, I think I don't think Supervisor Anderson. I think you may want to revise that because if you want to treat them like other first responders, uh, again that gets into the EMT and paramedic. And so I, I think I think because the, the way we've treated them is EMTs and paramedics in one bucket, and then everyone else in another. So I think I think what you probably want to say is recommend to the public health officer to begin vaccinating law enforcement officers now. Well, if that earns your vote, I'll happily. No, it's not going to earn my vote. It's, I'm, it's not going to earn my vote. What I'm trying to help you do is craft a motion that is consistent with what you're trying to do. But I, I don't support it. But I do want you to have a fair hearing of, of what you want. And that what you just suggested is a little inconsistent with what we're doing. So it would seem well, like. Uh, so 
uh, lifeguards all have that same training. Is that correct? Uh, I have, it's been conveyed to me, they do have EMT training. So any of the law enforcement that has EMT training now. Oh, we would do them today. If they have an EMT certificate and they were willing to be a vaccinator, sure. Okay. But I, I think very, very few of them have that. They do certainly respond. I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying the reason the firefighters and EMTs came in early was to build out the workforce. And, and so, and, and again, 27 counties do it, uh, the balance of the 58 don't. I've talked to some of the counties that do, and they just said, well, we've decided seniors can wait. Um, and, and again, that that's a decision, and that's kind of a decision you know we can we can make as a well, board. Let, let's let's put it in perspective too, though. We're talking about fewer than four thousand, so we're talking about uh, uh, one COVID vaccination day. We're not talking about uh, months or weeks or anything else. This this is not twenty thousand, forty thousand people we're talking Understood. about. Understood. And uh, and the other part is, uh, you know, while seniors are important. Everybody's also important when you have accidents, when you have uh, uh, 20,000 last year medical incidences where law enforcement showed up, gave CPR and saved people's lives. That's 20,000 people that were saved because law enforcement was there. So I, I just want to make sure that people are looking at it in perspective. And look, uh, uh, I have older siblings who are in lockdown because the facilities are in lockdown. I get how important those vaccines are to their lives and to all my constituents, but I also understand that um, uh, when responding to emergencies, law enforcement plays a very important role. Understood. You know, I I want to have more flexibility, so I think I'm going to keep the motion the same, and this gives a, a public health officer a chance, even, even if uh, Dr. Wooten were to say, look, we can't take care of it immediately right away, but we're going to make them the first, if we have open vaccinations, instead of allowing them to go to waste, we're going to prioritize that law enforcement to get that access. So I want to give her the most flexibility in order to get to that direction. But uh, for my communities, making sure that our law enforcement are there when we call 911, just like firefighters and lifeguards, I think that's really important. Fair enough. What, Supervisor Anderson, why don't we go to public comment? We'll come back to our public health officer, then hear from the board, and then we can sort out the Absolutely. Uh, confines of, of, of what your motion is. Uh, Mr. Clerk, how many do we have requests for public comment on this? We do. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Also know for the record that we received 62 e-comments on this item. We had uh, 10 individuals that have requested to speak on this item, so any individuals that requested to speak, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will again be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your phone. Each caller will be asked to state their name for the audio record and you'll have two minutes to address the board. You'll hear this sound when your time is up, so please conclude your comments at that time. I'd remind the public speakers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. Erin, if you could please identify the first caller. Thank you, our first caller is 5700. Five seven zero zero. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Zhang Wei, and I'm an organizer of CBI. I'm speaking today again to proposal to shift law enforcement into, into an upper tier for COVID vaccination. There is already a plan for vaccination of all profession and age health risk with much consideration. Law enforcement in the same tier with other essential workers. A study by Dr. Alyssa Riley that was recently shared with the COVID-19 task force joint meeting of the data and economic justice subcommittees review that grocery and other retail workers have a much higher occupational risk, resulting in an excess mortality of 39%, the highest rate compared to other essential workers. But this information about retail and grocery workers is not new, considering that KPBS did a series of articles revealing that the retail and grocery work store ranked number three and four of COVID outbreaks from March to November of last year. These workers are paid are paid some of the lowest wages, especially those who work in non-union workplaces, yet they receive less protection. So I will ask, where is the equity lens in this discussion today? Just to be clear, retail and grocery workers are only an example. Uh, there are other essential workers such as educational staff that are, are or will soon be forced into the classroom and must be considered as well. 
all the force, I'm sorry, all these folks should be in the same tier as a police officer. Police officers are no more important than those workers and should not be skipping the line while everyone else is still waiting for their turn. I ask the board supervisor to reject the proposal today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 9133. 9133. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Christina Selder and I'm here representing Serving Seniors. We'd like to offer our support for the county's continuation of its plan to prioritize the vaccination of seniors. To change course now could be dangerous. As has been stated, 90% of COVID deaths are people over the age of 65. Not only does the current plan reflect this reality, but it's also a responsive approach to help keep seniors out of expensive and limited ICU beds and hospitals and other long-term care centers. So we thank you for your consideration and all of your efforts to support the most vulnerable in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 5682. 5682. Hello, my name is Carrie Avila and I am an educator in North County. Good afternoon, San Diego County Board of Supervisors. I am advocating for San Diego to start providing vaccinations to the 1B tier, including workers in emergency services, education and childcare, and food and agriculture. While there are many districts that are using models of distance learning at this time, there are, however, many districts that are offering in-person learning. As mentioned in this meeting earlier, schools are a cornerstone of our communities. We have all seen firsthand the impact that distance learning has had, not only on students and families, but our communities as a whole. Getting the vaccine to school staff is needed to get our schools back in person. COVID is in our community. Our district has had 267 COVID positive cases of students and staff since we began in-person learning mid-October. What we saw today in the COVID report is that 54% of COVID positive cases are in the age group of 20 to 49. Many of our school personnel, law enforcement, and food and agriculture work workers fall into this age group. San Diego has the capacity to deliver about 20,000 doses a day. Schools are feeling the pressure to open to in-person instruction and educators and school staff find themselves in the same situation that law enforcement is in, wanting the vaccine so we, can, so we are safe to do the jobs that we love, but wondering why haven't we received them while other counties around us already have. And while at this time we must be patient while the vaccine gets to the most vulnerable in our community, the elderly and the healthcare workers, it does not change the fact that we need to begin vaccinating those who fall in the 1B tier for the overall safety of the people who protect and serve our communities. Please consider how to open up the next tier. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is 3640. 3640. Hi, uh, my name is David Garcia. I am the president of SEIU Local 221. You know, as this board knows, SEIU 221 is proud to represent essential workers, such as healthcare staff in our detention centers, social workers keeping our children safe, and environmental inspectors keeping our whole community safe. We think this item misses that point. The county needs to be laser focused in partnering with state federal government to increase the availability of vaccines and to invest in preparation and infrastructure and staffing to ensure that vaccines can be distributed to the public in an efficient and equitable way as soon as possible. Supervisor Anderson's proposal doesn't address the fundamental challenge of vaccinating the public, but instead pits our law enforcement against our essential workers and senior citizens. Anyone with common sense knows that nurses, social workers, health inspectors, janitors, firefighters are essential workers and should receive vaccines alongside law enforcement. And any efforts to put some essential workers ahead of others should be rejected. Essential workers have been on the front lines of keeping our community safe. We have firsthand knowledge across the county and in jails in particular where short staffing of healthcare staff and community service officers is exacerbated by exposure to COVID, pushing a problem into a crisis. Prioritizing vaccines for essential workers is not just a recognition of their service, but part of our overall recovery effort 
to keep critical functions running so that everyone can participate in the recovery. We urge you not to approve the proposal and it is current as it is currently written. If it is appropriate and possible to reconsider the order in which vaccinations are happening, then we need a robust analysis, analysis that takes into account all data points and the very goals of essential workers. Thank you. In the meantime, let's focus on trusting public health officials and wrap, um, ramp up vaccination efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 8623. 8623. Eight six two three. Please press star six to unmute yourself. If you don't respond, we'll go on to the next speaker and we'll come back to you. Our next speaker is seven five two two. Seven five two two. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Fletcher, uh, supervisors. My name is Harold Standerfer, and I'm calling from Encinitas. Uh, I'm speaking in opposition to this motion this afternoon um, as, the, as the board wrestles with a limited resource. There's not enough vaccine. Um, speaking as a senior, I can talk to the difficulties that we have faced in attempting to become vaccinated to make an appointment or, or to call in is extremely difficult and uh, no doubt due to the limited resource that's available. As has already been pointed out, most of the deaths and hospitalizations are falling in the age group of 60 and above, uh, which of course should make them a continued priority. Outbreaks at nursing homes as well have almost been a death sentence for those exposed to the virus. Uh, I urge the supervisors to not approve this motion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 8623. 8623. If not, we'll move on to 1766. 1766. Good afternoon, Supervisor. Supervisors and Chair of the Board Fletcher. My name is Deborah Rosen. I'm the President and CEO of the North San Diego Business Chamber. As many of you know, we host a, a public salute to our frontline healthcare heroes and law enforcement each year. I am writing to ask that you consider vaccines for our law enforcement in one of the first tiers. In the week of February 1st, there were two stories, both of them indicating that it was law enforcement that came to the scene and offered CPR before medical, um, uh, the emergency personnel were there. One is uh, by Tony Figueroa, and it was the shooting of um, a gentleman in Claremont Mesa and it said soon afterwards, officers pulled up, one officer grabbed medical equipment and took over CPR efforts. In another story, just a few days earlier, a 37-year-old teacher from Cathedral Catholic High School was shot. And the paper reported, after getting calls from the public, officers arrived to perform CPR on the man until medics arrived, but he died before he could be taken to a hospital. Our law enforcement are usually at the scene before fire and EMT. Our law enforcement officers are CPR trained and first aid trained. And while I don't think they are any more important than other essential workers, I think it is critical to consider getting them vaccinated up in one of the first tiers along with other essential workers. Thank you so much. I appreciate your um, taking a look at this and consideration of this, uh, approving this amendment. Thank you. And this is the last call for the speaker with last four digits, 8623. Hi, thank you. I was having some problems getting through. Um, I would 
uh, I'm calling in to oppose unless amended on this issue. I realize that Supervisor Anderson is concerned about the exposure of, of sheriff's deputies, but in fact, the, one of the highest exposure rates we have are in our county jails, where the positive rate is nearly 10% of the inmates who have been um, uh, tested. So I don't know if it would be possible to modify this proposal and focus on those deputies who are assigned to work in detention facilities, but those are the ones that are in, in that interior uh, shared space with people at a 10% infection rate are potentially at highest risk. And I would also add that the inmates need to be vaccinated because they are showing a much higher rate of infection than other populations. So uh, I would, as I say, oppose unless amended because I agree deputies are at risk, but that's because they're working around people who are at very high risk inside of our county jails. And I'm not sure we have enough public health nurses and other medical staff assigned to be keeping uh, those people safe and maintaining the types of uh, precautions that are necessary to keep COVID infection rates down. So that would be my recommendation on, on Supervisor Anderson's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And could you please state your name for the record? Uh, yes, this is Lori Saldana. Thank you. And that concludes public testimony on this item. Chair Fletcher. Thank you. I think we let's go to uh, Dr. Wooten. Uh, if she's here, I'd ask kind of, I think it's important we hear from our public health officer about uh, what we're doing and, and her thoughts, given this is a recommendation to her. Uh, and then also I would ask if we have any data uh, or information uh, surrounding um, COVID impacts on, on these two populations, seniors and law enforcement, that'd probably be helpful context for the board as well. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I actually have two slides to share uh, with you and your board. Um, our community epidemiology staff have identified uh, essential worker classifications uh, during case investigations. And the groups uh, prioritize to be vaccinated, which are healthcare personnel, and those in uh, congregate facilities, especially residents, are shown to be the greatest number and percentages of those diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, in this uh, graph that's uh, coming up, uh, I'll just continue to go through it and we'll catch up. Uh, in the first table that we have there is a comparison of cumulative cases and cases for a 14-day period from January 20th to February 2nd by healthcare workers, congregate settings, and law enforcement. Uh, congregate settings had the highest cumulative number of cases at 13,295 or 5.5%. This is primarily represented, however, by residents and not staff at 10,520 or 4.4%. In the 14-day period, the uh, patterns uh, were similar. Comparing first responders, which includes law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs. The paramedics, as has been noted, and the EMTs were vaccinated in phase 1A, as well as lifeguards, because they um, um, are rescuers and provide um, 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 CPR. Cumulatively, this group uh, represented uh, 996 cases, or 0.3%, and 500, or rather 55 cases, or 0.2% for the 14-day period identified. The very next group recommended for vaccination uh, will include essential workers, specifically law enforcement, firefighters that are not paramedics or EMTs, and um, uh, other emergency workers, including our staff that are responding uh, through the uh, incident command system, which includes myself, uh, as well as childcare uh, and educators, and then food and agriculture. The, the bottleneck here is vaccine. We do not have uh, adequate supplies. And I understand that other counties may be vaccinating, but most of those counties are much smaller than San Diego. When we anticipate these groups uh, to open up, uh, we anticipate that these groups will open up as more vaccine uh, is available. Now in the second slide, I wanna drill down even deeper where staff has compared law enforcement and those that are 65 uh, years of age and older. 
Those who are 65 um, and older represent 26,892 of the COVID cases, or 11 percent. Law enforcement represent 515 of the total number of COVID cases, or 0.2 percent. These data support the categories currently being recommended to be vaccinated uh, by the federal and state governments. And to date, San Diego County is vaccinating uh, healthcare personnel, uh, which is all of phase 1A, and then 1B, uh, part of uh, tier one of uh, phase 1B, which is 65 and older. As soon as more vaccines are um, received into our region, Law enforcement, uh, which is a part of the overall um, emergency responders, is absolutely next in line to be vaccinated along with uh, child care and educators as well as food and uh, agriculture uh, industry. So th that con con uh, concludes what I wanted to share uh, with you, uh, Supervisor uh, Fletcher. Uh, just one more point. I talked about overall cases. We see here hospitalizations. I think another point to uh, issue to point out is, is that 65 years of age and older represents 48.7% of those individuals that are being hospitalized, whereas law enforcement is 18 number, which is 0.2%. And then when it comes to deaths, that's another category that's uh, significant. And while no death uh, is um, uh, insignificant. Our 65 years of age and older represents 79% of all of those individuals that have died while we've had two deaths uh, with law enforcement attributable to COVID-19, which is 0.1%. And so in closing, law enforcement, along with the other uh, central groups that I've mentioned, will be next in line. But all of this is predicated on our availability of uh, vaccines. Uh, vaccines and an increased vaccine supply to our specific region. Dr. Wooten, would it be uh, your public health advice uh, at this time that we would change and add any uh, younger workforces uh, before we completed offering it to seniors? I would not change the current uh, recommendations that are in place. I do have one other point. Uh, the Supervisor Anderson uh, mentioned uh, allocating leftover vaccine at the end of the day in our um, uh, community pods. Actually, uh, at the begin of last, beginning of last month, our um, vaccination teams started to do that. So they, for any vaccine uh, leftover, uh, they were offering it to um, uh, firefighters, law enforcement, as well as teachers. So we are currently already uh, doing that. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to uh, board discussion. I saw, I believe, Supervisor Lawson Reamer uh, had her hand up, I believe, if I saw correct. Uh, and then I know Supervisor Desmond, I see, uh, we'll go to next. I just wanted to, to echo that, you know, obviously this is a, you know, this is a challenging uh, time. You know, we, we don't have enough vaccine doses. Um, there's a lot of folks out there every single day serving our communities and, and putting themselves in harm's way. Um, and there's the fundamental problem is we just don't have enough vaccine doses to go around, right? And so this is the dilemma that the CDC has been struggling with, you know, panels of ethicists, um, you know, for the last many, many months. And um, I personally don't think it's uh, sort of the place of, of politics to get in the way of this. I really do want to be deferential to uh, our public health officer and, um, you know, take that guidance. And I do want to uplift and acknowledge the important service of our law enforcement officers, as well as our teachers, who uh, also um, have about 4,000 people who uh, would need to get vaccinated in order for schools to get open and, and for our kids to to get out of the in front of zoom and back into the classrooms and you know the grocery workers and the agricultural workers who make sure that we can eat uh, and that our entire food chain hasn't broken down i think if we all remember back last march you know there were there's no food on the shelves because people were so afraid that our entire system was going to come to a screeching halt um and you know it's the it's really the service of the grocery workers and the agricultural workers who've you know, put themselves in harm's way as well in these difficult times. So it is just a really, really hard position to be in um, that where you don't have enough vaccines doses to go around. And I 
Um, I am so grateful for the, uh, the service of our law enforcement officials and officers. And um, I just have to say, I hope we can get more doses as quickly as possible. So all of the folks in the next tier, our, our law enforcement, our teachers, and our other essential workers can get um, vaccinated as quickly as possible because this has to be a very high priority. And um, you know, I know we're all doing it the best we can to have that capacity to, to, to uh, administer those doses as soon as we have them. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond, I, I thought I saw you. Yes, I did. And I'm just asking, uh, well, first of all, just asking uh, Supervisor Anderson if he's still keeping his motion on the floor. And I, I don't think we're quite clear what motion's on the floor. So maybe we could restate that. And then then that might answer your question too, Supervisor Desmond. You know what, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, I, and I did it to myself. Um, uh, it's the same motion that we had originally talked about. You had offered uh, an, uh, restating it in a different way, but I restated it in the same way. We did a poll on our county website and we asked and sent out emails into our district and 97% uh, of the people I represent are fully supportive of this. And look, everyone's district is, district is completely different and I'm not saying what's best for your district in the slightest, but for us in East County in the people I represent, we'd like to have a vote and we'd like to still move law enforcement up because they're so critical in the role to our communities. Uh, I get that seniors are more likely to die than law enforcement, but when I'm in trouble, when the senior's in trouble, that's frequently law enforcement's the first to get there and, and give them CPR and help them. And I think that if law enforcement shows up and gives them COVID, I think that's a bad thing. And so I'm not worried about law enforcement necessarily passing as Dr. Wooden went through the numbers. I'm worried that they be super spreaders and I don't want that to, to happen. So I, I'm, I'm still interested in, in having a vote if I get a second. Okay, um, Chair Fletcher, if, if I may continue. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and second the motion. You know, I appreciate Supervisor Anderson bringing this item forward. And I, I agree that we should allow law enforcement to receive the vaccine. And, and uh, although, you know, the comparison was made as seniors versus um, uh, law enforcement, uh, absolutely, you know, I think it was kind of disingenuous to say, well, how many seniors do you want to have die? Uh, to, because also in phase 1A, we've got the ski patrol, we've got uh, pharmacy clerks, we've got lifeguards, we've got lactation consultants, we've got mortuary and funeral staff. And a lot of these people could be young and healthy and, and, and going ahead of law enforcement. And you know, right now, we just found out the number one killer of law enforcement in the line of duty right now is COVID-19. You know, when they get a call, they got to go into somebody's house. They, you know, they give CPR. They, they don't, you know, often have a chance on, or, you know, they don't have any discretion on a call that they go to. And I agree, you know, with uh, Supervisor Anderson, they could be super spreaders and, you know, representing the unincorporated area and having the sheriffs, you know, out, doing these services. And this is not just for the sheriffs, this is for all law enforcement. Um, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Wooten's uh, position on this. Um, and we as a board can take a position and she has, can have a different position, which is, which is fine. But, uh, you know, I think law enforcement should always be a high priority and I'm, I'm happy to support the effort today. You know, the, and I'll just go off on a brief little tangent. I also, also believe that it's critical we get our kids back in school. You know, I've shared stories before the bear, the bears re repeating, we, you know, we see headlines about teen suicides rising in the country. I'm also hearing about many parents can be concerned about their children and their physical and mental health. Also, uh, uh, we've seen our kids suffer over the last year. You know, it's about getting them into the classroom. So I'd love to see teachers moved up as, as well, but I'll, I'll leave the motion as is and support it. I would like to ask, ask Dr. Wooten though, because I think it was stated earlier, Dr. Whitney, you said in tier one of 1B, uh, there's education, child care, emergency services, food and agriculture. Is there a, a tiering in, I guess, of tier one or prioritization? In other words, of those sectors, education, child care, emergency services, and food and agriculture, could it be potentially that emergency services and teachers go first and second in that, in that tier one of 1B? So 
thank you for that question, um, Supervisor Desmond. Um, phase 1B, uh, tier 1 is what we're in right now, and that's the 75 and older, and then 65 to 74, essentially 65 years of age and older. The remaining uh, uh, groups in Phase 1B Tier 1 includes uh, emergency workers, which includes firefighters and law enforcement, it includes educators and child care, and it includes um, food and agriculture. Those are the next groups that are first in line when our vaccine supply is, in, is increased. Uh, this past week, we only received 25% of the total uh, number of vaccines that were allocated to us. During the recess uh, before this uh, item came up, I received a call from the state asking us to balance, uh, do a balancing act as it relates to vaccines appropriated to some of our providers. So vaccines are limited. I would love to open it up for all of our essential workers. Uh, there are 16 categories of essential workers, but we just don't have the vaccines available to do that. If we did that, we would have a lot more complaints and emails than what we are even currently uh, receiving. So uh, our practice is to open up appointments based on the vaccine supply that we have. And we are doing this week to week, almost sometimes day to day, in terms of trying to get enough vaccines so that our community pods can be open, so that our super stations can provide vaccines to the general community. Thank you. Well, and, and I thank you for that. And considering the fact that we have a limited number of vaccines, which I get, would it be potential then of that tier one of phase 1B, instead of opening it up to education, child care, emergency services, and food and agriculture, could it be potentially, could we open it that up to out of that tier, prioritize that tier one in that first out of tier one, law enforcement? Second out of tier one, teachers. Third out of tier one, you know, uh, child care. Fourth out of food and, food and agriculture. I'm just wondering, since we do have a limited number of vaccines, why then would we move it to open it up to all those sectors in the next tier as opposed to prioritizing that tier? Uh, that certainly is an option, but it's, it's also, if we get additional vaccines, uh, I feel we can open up to all three of those essential, those groups of essential workers. But again, firefighters, law enforcement will be absolutely next in line. It is not, uh, uh, we, it, it is not uh, uh, remiss of us to understand the importance of having law enforcement, also having our teachers vaccinated. But again, okay. everything goes back to vaccine supply. Well, it sounds like, yeah, and if we, if we have limited supply, we may have to prioritize. If we don't, if we have, a lot, um, plenty of supply for all of them. Uh, we could do them all at once, but if we have limited supply, I would like to see uh, at request that you would prioritize um, in that list if we if we don't have. That enough. will be considered, Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you. I think just real quick on that point, then we'll go to Supervisor Vargas. Um, I think once we're able to open that tier, uh, that that first tier of essential workers, which is next, uh, I think we've certainly been considerable effort put in place. Uh, to have dedicated sites uh, for teachers and law enforcement to be able to go. Uh, the number of law enforcement is uh, considerably less uh, than the number of teachers, and I think they would be able to be done very rapidly and very quickly. Um, but again, we're working to build out dedicated capacity for both, and I think we'll be able to do them and do them uh, very quickly. Um, we just have to get we have to, to get to that tier as, as we presently go. Um, Supervisor Vargas. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm glad to hear Supervisor Desmond acknowledge that COVID is real and that uh, vaccines are a priority. I mean, I'm really excited that we're at this place now when we're all advocating for um, continued uh, resources um, uh, around these issues. But I do want to say thank you to Dr. Wooden. I really want to thank her for making a recommendation based on science and data. And I know that this is a really challenging time, like so some of my colleagues have already mentioned. I want to make sure we continue to prioritize the most vulnerable individuals in our community. And um, although um, I, I am, you know, I acknowledge the great work that our law enforcement um, community does, there's already over 2,800 San Diegans that have passed away from COVID and thousands more are still suffering from symptoms 
And our entire county is absolutely eager to making sure that, uh, you know, the vaccines are available to everyone. But, you know, I understand the group prioritizing a vaccination. Um, everybody wants to be at the top of the line. We, But we, I think, have a responsibility to ensure that it's a fair and equitable method of vaccinating the most vulnerable. Um, the communities of color in my district are dying from COVID-19. And I am the first person to tell you that I want all essential workers to get the vaccines. I had a conversation this Saturday with SCIU airport workers who have actually um, are advocating because some of the members have passed away and they haven't stopped working as well. And so in my district, people are dying from COVID-19. And this time, you know, I just want to say that I, I'm standing strong with uh, Dr. Wooden's recommendations of focusing on our el elderly and those over 65, um, you know, is, is what we need to prioritize right now in our healthcare uh, workers. So prioritizing one group of essential workers over the rest of the essential workers to me is not equitable. And I understand it might not be the politically correct thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. And so uh, while law enforcement I, um, should get their vaccines uh, when their term comes, uh, and I have spoken to Chief Kennedy and to other folks um, in my district as well, um, I cannot support this advancement at this time. And um, I will continue to make sure that we do everything we can so that we can advocate at the national level for additional vaccines and, and uh, create, continue to create the pods and everything else that we need to do but at this time, I cannot support your motion, um, Supervisor Anderson. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Anderson, a second by Supervisor Desmond. Uh, seems like now would be a good time to call the roll. Any final thoughts or are we good to vote? Let's. let's if I may, I just want to say uh, uh, I certainly respect all my colleagues here. We all have to represent our districts to the best of our ability. But it's very clear in my district that this vote's important. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. Ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer. No. Supervisor Desmond. Aye. Vice Chair Vargas. No. Chair Fletcher. Fletcher, no. That motion fails with Supervisor Anderson and Supervisor Desmond voting aye, all other supervisors being present and voting no. That concludes the business before the board today. Uh, with that, we will proceed to closed session and this meeting stands adjourned. The board will now recess into closed session to consider those matters listed under item 15 on today's agenda. If there are any reportable actions, they will be reported out prior to the start of the planning and land use session of this meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, February 10th, 2021.